OTAN Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. So welcome. Um, thank you all for coming. We are going to be talking about designing our um, adult basic ed and ESL courses for our flexible environment. Um, I'm Heather Martin. I am one of our ESL supervisors at Elgin Community College outside of Chicago. And with me, oh, she's unmuting. There you go. <laughs> and um, my name is Marsha Luptak. I am the Associate Dean of Adult Education at Elgin Community College. Okay, so just so you know, as we go through the presentation, we will stop periodically um, and take questions. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat, or um, you can just hold on to them until we get to one of our little question and answer breaks. So first, to give you a little bit of background about our institution and our program, like I said, we are from Elgin Community College. We're about 50 miles northwest of Chicago. So it's a little bit later in the day for us, um, and we're glad we figured that out before conference time. Uh, we do have that picture you see is our main campus. We also have three additional campuses. Um, in fall of 2019, our enrollment was about just under 10,000 to give you an idea of the size of the institution. And the breakdown of that enrollment um, is we are a Hispanic serving institution. We have about 45 and a half percent um, Latinx students, 38 percent white students, a little under 5 percent African American, a little over 7 percent Asian, and then less than 1 percent of Native American and Pacific Islander. What you're looking at there is our, our little home in Elgin Community College. Uh, that's our building where we house our adult basic education center. Um, our entire program that happens on the main campus um, is in that building for the most part. And our program, our fall 2019 enrollment was about 1200. Um, it's much lower this year due to COVID and other issues, obviously. We uh, serve our students at five different locations. So not only do we have our campuses, uh, but we also have a few community locations that we use for our classes as well. We have about 10 levels of ESL, five to six levels of adult basic and secondary ed. We also have bridge classes and integrated classes also. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, give you a little bit of background on why we did this, how this, how we did this. Everybody knows about um, the closings due to COVID. Um, we left our campus on Friday, March 13th, thinking that we had another week to prepare for the closings. Um, we got an announcement at about 5.30 that evening from the governor saying that all schools were gonna be closed. Um, we were able to, administrators were able to come on campus the next Monday, uh, March 16th, but all classes, from that point forward could not be held in person. So we had to make this immediate transition to this online format. Um, we, we were one week before spring break. So the college decided to give us the week before spring break and spring break to prepare to this new environment, get our faculty ready, um, get our students ready for it. So we had this really quick transition, you know, not knowing how to approach it. Um, a couple of things that we did initially is that we did um, develop some faculty trainings, um, how to use Zoom, how to teach online um, during the spring break so that faculty could get comfortable with the tools. Um, we also developed a faculty forum so teachers could talk to each other about what they were doing, ask questions, and have that communication open to them. Because again, all of us are working remotely. We couldn't do this in person. Uh, we also developed a communication plan with our students because we knew we only had two weeks after spring break and then our spring semester was over. So we had two weeks to teach classes, but also communicate with students what was going to be coming up for the next semester, for the fall, et cetera. So um, a lot of our teachers were using the Remind app. So we used the Remind app with our students just so that they had a link to us after the clo college closed. Um, so for that two weeks, the last two weeks of classes, we were really in survival mode. 
Um, we determined our summer semester started at the end of April. We determined that we just couldn't do it. There was no way for us to get our students registered, um, get our classes set up with the survival mode going on. So we canceled our summer classes, which ended up being beneficial for us because it gave us some time to prepare. Uh, next slide, Heather. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the decision-making process. Um, we wanted to make sure when we made decisions about how we were going to um, do our fall semester that we got some data, some information so that we made an informed decision. Um, again, I talked about we had the faculty forum. Uh, this had a lot of lively discussion. We got to see what teachers were doing, what kinds of problems they were having as far as connecting with students. Um, faculty were sharing ideas about how they were able to contact students, how they were able to teach students, what tools they were using. Uh, our faculty were extremely re resourceful in this, and we learned a lot just from these discussions with faculty. So administrators and faculty were all on the same forum and we all shared ideas and kind of supported each other. So this gave us one um, source of information to inform us for the fall semester. Um, during this time, we also sent out a survey uh, for students to see how many students made the transition from the face-to-face -face classes to the remote classes. We really wanted to know how many students we lost, how many students we held, which students, because one of the things that we wanted to know is, you know, is it just the higher level students in our program? Is it the lower levels? Which students are still attending? Um, we also asked how many students successfully completed the classes. We asked the teachers this, we did a teacher survey and asked them about that. Um, some of our findings, actually, they were better than we expected. Uh, we were really worried that we'd lose all of our students because they had no communication face-to-face -face about this transition. But we found that our lower levels in our program had an average of a 50% sex success rate, which was really amazing. And when we looked closer at the numbers, we realized it was actually higher than that in the classes with the teachers who knew how to use technology effectively. Uh, the 50% was uh, that lower number because we had one or two teachers that really struggled with it. So overall, we felt that, okay, yes, we can do this with our lower levels. Our higher levels had even a higher success rate. Um, they were at 80 to 90% um, of the students making a transition successfully and being able to complete the class, um, being able to pass the class. Again, we found the success really depended on a couple of things. One was the faculty's familiarity with online instruction, how comfortable they felt using our course management system or Google Classroom or other tools. Um, the other thing that we found that some of our teachers used our LMS or learning management system prior to the shutdown, those teachers kept 90% of their students because the students already knew where to go. They'd already accessed the system. It was accessible from their homes. It was accessible on their cell phones. So we found that having that LMS in place really made a difference in the success rate. And again, um, we, we um, used Remind just to communicate with faculty and students, which is really a wonderful tool because we were able to translate our messages as well for students. And students could ask us questions in their language that would translate it back for us. So we were really able to do a lot of things with this. Um, our faculty survey, we asked the faculty, okay, what worked? What didn't work? We wanted some feedback from them. What tools were they using? Um, we found that our tech, our, overall our faculty were very flexible and very resourceful. Uh, the biggest thing was they would have liked to have had more time to prepare and maybe a little bit more training. You know, we, again, two weeks wasn't much time for training. So we took that into consideration when we started planning for fall. All right. So when we um, went through uh, the process, we had to go through several channels and I see your question, I'll, we'll ask, answer your questions in just a few minutes. Um, the decision-making process actually involved three different entities. Uh, we worked with our distance learning department um, was really important to collaborate with them because we need to know 
what could they support? You know, if we use Google Classroom, could they support our classes and our students, or do we need to use the LMS? Um, we also need to talk about our students' needs and their comfort levels with the system, and they really helped us out a lot with this decision making. Originally, we thought we might use Google Classroom with its lower levels and D2L or Brightspace, which is our learning management system for the upper levels. But after talking to distance learning, we realized that really it was best to use um, the D2L management system because it had training videos. We had um, faculty training available. They had student support available. There was all sorts of tools already there that would make it easier for us to use that. Um, the second entity that we had to um, co collaborate with was ICCB. So for the most part, there was very limited online adult ed opportunities in the state of Illinois. Uh, the only thing that had been approved prior to this was um, a program that was geared towards ASE students. And, oh, thank you, Heather. So ICCB is our Illinois Community College Board. Um, we so forget it, where we're presenting right now since we're sitting in our houses. <laughs> yeah. So that was one of the things they had only approved this one curriculum. It was only ASE high. So we had to wait and see if they would um, allow us to use other systems, other um, courses, what this would look like. So we really had to wait on ICCB for their decisions on what would be allowable. Um, they also had to develop processes and procedures because they didn't have any in place. We had just been talking about moving classes online. So this kind of was like a rush job. We had to really make these decisions quickly. Um, what we found is that we had to keep our curriculum or use a canned course that was approved by ICCB. Those were our two choices. And if we used our own curriculum, that would be easier to approve because um, they already knew the content. They just needed to know how we were going to deliver it. We also had a discussion about synchronous and asynchronous classes. Because again, our students really need that face-to-face -face feel with their teachers. Um, we felt that a fully online course wouldn't have the same kind of interaction. It doesn't have the same um, collaboration between students online. It's a little bit more difficult. So we wanted to make sure that we could do a hybrid or a flex class where we had a synchronous component where the teachers met with the students on Zoom and then an asynchronous component where the students were on a course management system. So these were some of the things that we had to get guidance from ICCB. Um, we also had to wait for our college to, to make decisions. I know a lot of colleges weren't sure if they were gonna be in person in fall or if we were gonna to be totally online in fall. Um, we kind of made some guesses early on saying, it looks like it's gonna be really bad. Most likely we're not gonna be on campus in fall. So that was another decision that we had to make. We, we made the decision before the college did, but we were very fortunate. Our college made the decision in early June, late May. So it gave us plenty of time to plan for fall. So we were very fortunate that our college was very proactive in this process. All right, Heather, we'll move. Okay. All right, so like Marcia said, um, we decided on a hybrid model and you know, we did weigh all of our options. We looked, especially because our community college board was um, the, the process to create new courses would have been very lengthy um, and not efficient at all. So because we were kind of stuck either using our existing courses um, and sticking with those outcomes or just using a canned package, um, we did kind of weigh that and decide that hybrid was our best option. We also wanted to make sure that whatever solution we came up with was adaptable and flexible because we had no idea what the restrictions were going to be moving forward. Obviously, as we've all dealt with it, we have no idea how long it was going to last, what types of restrictions would be, you know, what kind of caps on capacity and procedures would be in place at our institution. Additionally, our students are so at risk between being, you know, essential workers and health restrictions and um, you know, family structures and living situations and things like that. So we wanted to make sure that what we did was kind of malleable and we could adapt it moving forward as we needed to, as restrictions were lifted and, or put back in place. 
And so our hybrid model has 50% face-to-face, which in this case, our face-to-face is still via Zoom. However, as restrictions are lifted and things are opened up, we will um, ultimately be able to offer that synchronous component face-to-face uh, in person. And then the other 50% of the course is asynchronous. And like Marcia said, um, we house that in our LMS, which I'll talk about in a minute. Another priority we had with the development of the courses um, and kind of deciding the direction we were going to go was the flexibility of the texts and resources. We really wanted to make sure we used as many open resources as possible. And part of the reason for that was because it allows for a lot of adaptability um, for our instructors and for our students. They're very robust resources. And additionally, it's cost effective. Um, and then we also, like Marcia said, wanted to make sure that we did have that direct synchronous component embedded somewhere in our courses. And then for the LMS, we did have a lot of discussions about different ways to develop um, or to deliver our courses. I think originally when we were sent home and everyone was in survival mode for those few weeks, our teachers were using whatever tools they and their students were accustomed to. I mean, we had a lot of like phone calls going on and people, some people were Zooming, some people were using things like Google Classroom. So, I mean, it was just all across the board. And I mean, we had students sitting in Starbucks parking lots on their phones half the time. It was crazy. And like the resilience of our students and our faculty definitely um, showed for sure. But um, we did, I think, probably talk about Google Classroom more than anything else because a lot of our faculty is very familiar with it. Some of them already used it with their students and a lot of them use it um, teaching in their full-time K-12 jobs. Additionally, a lot of our students were familiar with it because their kids were getting to know it and because their teachers could have already used it potentially. However, the deciding factor um, was that we would not have the institutional support we needed. Um, so even though we kind of liked the visual stimulation of Google Classroom and the way you could kind of aesthetically uh, do what you'd like with it in a way, the flexibility there, we decided that not having the support of our distance learning team was going to be um, very detrimental. And so um, we did go with our LMS, which like Marcia said is Brightspace C2L, which it allowed for the institutional support. And we also thought that it was a good tool for our students as they increase you know, rigor and for our students that want to transition to credit courses, they're already familiar with the LMS, which is great. So we are going to pause now for some questions. Um, I know we had one in the chat that was, um, is the majority of our students, were they already in possession of computers and laptops? And the answer to that is no. When we went for the spring, like when COVID hit and we were shut down, it was just like the wild west. And if you had a device, then great. And if you didn't have a device, then hopefully we could get you some in some way, but we didn't really know how yet. Um, since then, we have had great institutional support and our students have been able to borrow Chromebooks from our college library. Um, we did have a lot of like community organizations with hotspots and things like that. Marcia, do you want to add anything onto that? Sure. So one of the things that we discovered is that most of our students actually were attending class in that last two weeks via their cell phones. So that was a really good um, piece of information for us to have. And that was also part of the decision-making process is that we wanted to make sure that students could access the classes via cell phones, via um, laptops, via um, tablets, any different, you know, these, all of these different ways. And that when they access them from these other tools, from, from these other um, devices, that the um, interaction was the same, the interface was the same, and that was another advantage of using um, our learning management system, D2L, was that it's very easy to maneuver on a cell phone. It's not desirable because the print's so small, you know, you're limited by that, but at least students had that. And like Heather said, we also wanted to make sure if we could get Chromebooks, we, we ordered a bunch of Chromebooks, get Chromebooks and hotspots to students who needed them because it's really a better way to learn. Um, they can be more interactive. But again, when we, when we did this quick transition, most of our students did not have laptops or computers. 
Are there any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. Thank you for answering that. Uh, what we found is that our population is mostly working in agriculture and the wine industry and their digital literacy was very low. They do not have computers. They don't know even, you know, really how to turn it on or use it. So it was very interesting to hear your, your, your percentages of retention in the higher levels and then going down. And I just wondered how that related to the device that they were using. So thank you for answering. Yeah, we're still grappling with the the kind of digital literacy issue and trying to figure out the best way to reach all of our students. Um, I think we've been impressed generally with how how quickly they've adapted, but um, there is definitely a learning curve and we're definitely meeting the needs of some different populations than we did previously and maybe not meeting the needs of some others. So it's been a trade off for sure. Well, and one of the things that we discovered is that we needed to do some training for students before the classes started. So we moved our orientations are also on our LMS. So we give students support before they start the classes. They go through the orientation. If they can't get on, uh, we go onto the computer or we go onto the phones and we Zoom with them or we talk to them over the phone. So we have, we make sure that they can get into the LMS and do some basic navigation of it before they start the classes, just to introduce them to that. Um, another thing that we offered this last semester is we said, hey, we'll have some training in Zoom, how to use the different tools in Zoom before classes started. And that was optional for students, but the orientation was required for all students, even if they were returning, because we wanted to have the opportunity for them to interact with the interface and see if there were any issues that they had on their end accessing it. And did you make your own materials for the Zoom instruction that you give to students? Yes, we basically, um, I mean, we kept the Zoom workshops very, very basic. It's, you know, sharing your screen and muting and unmuting, chatting, joining a breakout room. But we did. I, what I did was I went to the Zoom um, help site is great, the Zoom support site, but not necessarily for our lower level students, which is who we expected at the Zoom workshops. So I went through um, everything that was on there for the most basic functions. And I pretty much just sniffed, I like the screen sniff tool has been my best friend for the last 11 and a half months. I snip everything and put it on a Google doc. So yes. Well, and another thing that we've done with the Remind app, um, when they go through the orientation, we try to get them on the Remind app so that if they have trouble accessing the class the first week of class, um, one of us can help them with that support one-on-one -on -one usually. Um, when we send out their class information, they're given our information so they can email us or they can text us. So we really try to give as much support for those students as we can. And they do reach out to us. I'm, I can't tell you, we, we have students just, they're, they're very excited about being in class. They're a little nervous about the technology, but they're more excited about class and willing to reach out and say, hey, I can't get into my class. I'm having troubles with this. And we do support them when they reach out to us. Getting everyone on has been very labor intensive. I mean, we've all, I have like cell phone numbers of students like brothers-in-law who I have to call on their lunch break so that we can set something up for translation purposes. And we've had Zoom meetings at all crazy hours. And I mean, it's, it's been quite a task. Um, all right, well, if there are no additional questions, we'll move on. And like I said, we do have more of these little question breaks coming up. All right, Marsha. I have an H on this one. Okay. Really? I <laughs> do. don't. I have an M on this one. I'm happy to say it though. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. So um, the first thing we did was identify our instructors. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the instructors for our design team were, had some type of background in course design and were comfortable with technology. We also wanted to make sure that they were very flexible um, and that they were collaborative. 
So the first thing we did was have an information session. We gave an overview to all of our students, or sorry, all of our developers, our instructors that we had contacted about being on the development team. We gave some details. We really wanted to prioritize UDL principles, which we'll talk a little bit about later. We talked about kind of the structure um, that we wanted to look at as far and the timeline, the expectations, because it was, you know, it's not often that people develop an entire program's worth of, of courses in like less than two months. So it was obviously a very, you know, uh, we wanted to make sure they knew what they were signing up for. Um, we also had a little training about, um, well, not yet, but we talked about, um, you know, compliance, making sure that everything was uh, ADA compliant, things like that, 508 compliance. And we wanted to make sure that when they committed to the project, they knew what they were committing to. Then when we had those instructors and they committed, we assigned the instructors to different courses based on their experience and famili familiarity with those courses and the curricula. As we said previously, we had to stick with the original course outcomes and outlines so that we didn't have to go through the approval process. So basically, if someone was comfortable with a course and the curriculum, they went right to that course, which was um, convenient, obviously. We developed teams based on NRS levels of the courses and assigned team leaders. So most of the team leaders were administrators with one exception. We had a full-time faculty member as one of our team leaders. And those teams met on a weekly basis just to kind of compare and go through everything. Um, some classes had co-developers and that had mixed results. In some cases, those co-developers um, really brought out like different creative sides of each other. And in some cases, it looked like there were two different people designing a course to be perfectly honest. Um, and then, we set up collaborative procedures. We use Google folders and Google Docs so that each team had access to everyone else's development. So that way they could see kind of what types of assessments and things people were developing and the progress and kind of track um, the curriculum across the program. Um, and then, as I said, we did have weekly meetings uh, to discuss progress, to troubleshoot. I think a lot of times it was kind of a therapy session also like, oh my gosh, we already have like this much done. We have this much left. Um, but it was nice to kind of make sure everyone was on the same page to check in. A lot of times we would share what we had done, kind of compare and contrast, see if we had preferences, make sure that we were incorporating a lot of different things into the courses. Marsha, do you have me saying this yep. one too? <laughs> no, no, this one's mine. This one's mine. So Heather kind of gave you a brief overview. We're going to go a little bit more into detail about each part of this because there's um, it was a pretty um, complicated process trying to figure out how to develop these courses. Um, we really wanted to do it as a team model rather than having teachers develop individualized courses because we wanted to have a consistency and a flow from level to level. And so that students would know what to expect. Once they finish one class, they'd be able to move to the next class and it would have the exact same format. So a couple of things that we did to this is we gave uh, teachers had shared access to each other's courses in the LMS. And this allowed them to make sure that what they were doing was consistent with what other teachers were doing. Um, it allowed for peer feedback. It allowed for a lot of rich discussions about how is the best way to um, put the structure this so that was a, that was one of the things that we really found valuable was the shared access um, there were some I'll be honest there were some issues because sometimes we got into um, heated discussions over different teaching styles and philosophies some teachers thought it should look like this and other teachers thought it should look like this so there was there was some debate but I think it was a healthy debate because it really made us develop stronger classes overall because people came from different viewpoints. As we um, went through the process, we kind of developed the structure of the classes we went along because when we started, we really didn't know exactly how we wanted these to be structured. A lot of it depended on what teachers gave as far as feedback. A lot of it depended on the assessments and the outcomes that we were developing. But we, and we also wanted the faculty to have some input into the design process. Um, all of them were it, taking uh, a class on the course management system. 
They were using a system that used module guides that walked them through the classes. And we were kind of measuring, is that a way that we want to do it with our students? And that was one of the discussions we had. We said, well, these module guides are really challenging. We're having trouble going through this class and finding out where things are and this component's here, this component's there. So we really had a lot of really good discussions about how can we make this accessible and easy for our students to do. So we came up with a checklist system. So the students could go through and they'd have first do this, then do this, and they could check them off as they went through the lesson. This allowed the teacher to see that they completed it, allowed the students to see that they completed it. It also was very easy, they just had to click on this one page and it took them to all of the different worksheets or the videos and everything were all on one page. They could access them that way. One of our teachers did come back later and said, well, there's too many clicks. They have to have three clicks to get to the checklist. But we had to do that a little bit. We talked about structure, about having you know, different units, different modules, so that the students could do just one piece of it rather than having a whole module or a whole month's worth of material in one unit. We thought it was better to break it down into modules. And then we even broke it down into sub-modules. So that was really important for us that we really thought about the structure and we did all of this before anybody put anything into the LMS, which was a, you know, the best idea, don't, don't develop in the LMS. You need to develop a plan before the LMS. So the um, sheet here you have is what we use for a planning sheet. The teacher went through and said, okay, what are my outcomes? What are my objectives for this class? Then they thought about the synchronous class, what's going to happen in the class and what are the materials that are needed? what's gonna happen in the asynchronous or the LMS, the, the uh, online piece, and what are the materials that the teachers need there. So the teachers developed all of these before we touched the LMS itself, just because we wanted to make sure that they were really well planned, they were really well, well structured. We knew we could make adjustments once we started entering it, but we really wanted it to be thought out in advance. Um, the other thing that we did is we established a timeline for the whole process. Now, again, by the time we had the meeting with the teachers mid-May, we had, we had identified the teachers and everything else by mid-May, and we'd had our pre-meeting, we had talked about accessibility, we talked about open education resources, we talked about um, Creative Commons and how that can be used to find resources. But we really had an aggressive timeline because we had to have the courses in by a certain date to be reviewed by distance learning, by the state, by our dean. And then we also had to give access to the teachers that would be teaching the classes in fall a month in advance so that they could review the classes and become familiar with them because these were course shells that were shared across sections. So it was really, we came up with this very aggressive timeline. Um, our original due date was June 30th. And that was going to give us two weeks before the due date that we had with distance learning and with the state in order to go back and do some reflection, revision and review. What it ended up being is it allowed us, we had two weeks of flexibility. So um, we were able to push some of the dates. We found that it was a little bit more challenging in some of the stages for the teachers to get to meet the deadlines. So we had that flexibility. We had that two weeks built into the schedule where it was like, okay, we can, we can slow down. We can, we can take a pause. Um, and work on this piece a little bit longer. All right, next. So I mentioned that um, our faculty all went through um, training for the learning management system. So when the college made the determination that they were going to move all of the classes into a virtual environment online um, with synchronous, asynchronous components for many of the classes, the college determined that every faculty member would have to go through training on our learning management system, D2L, in order to be eligible to teach. We were able to jump ahead of the college with this a little bit. We had already set up a special training session just for the adult ed teachers. So they had a special class set up just for them that was two weeks earlier than the other classes that started for the rest, rest of the college. Um, this was great because it really allowed the, the faculty to talk to one another and to collaborate during the training. You know, when they had discussion boards, they would be able to talk about it, which was really nice. 
Um, the challenge was that, that the teachers were taking this training at the same time as they were developing the courses. So they were really learning about the LMS system as they were developing. And that did make it a little bit more challenging for them because they didn't have a vision from the beginning of what an online course looked like. And they were learning as they were going along and they were making adjustments as they learned. So that was a positive, but it was really challenging for them because they were doing this training at the same time as developing rather than ideally doing the training and then developing the course. Um, we also had an additional training that was in May at the very beginning for all of our faculty, but especially for our course developers on 508 um, requirements. We had our um, special learning needs person and our distance learning person came and did a virtual um, presentation just for our group, talking about advancing equity and inclusion using accessible digital materials. It was really great and it really gave us an idea of what kind of formats we used. Um, a lot of questions came up as to what is better? Do we use PDFs or do we use Word documents? How do we check accessibility in this type of document? And all those questions came up during that training. So it was a very big consideration because it is a requirement by our community college board and by law that all classes are accessible. So this was a great um, pre-development activity that we had for our teachers. And we're going to stop for another time for questions if you have any. Feel free to unmute yourselves. I do. Sorry, it's me yeah. again. That's great. So the adult ed program is under the umbrella of the college itself, correct? Yes. Okay. So the adult ed staff was participating in the training that was given to the entire staff of the college? Correct. Gotcha. Yes, I, I, I realize that every state has a different system of, what, of how it's set up. Yeah, we, we fall right directly under our college. That's why, you know, again, the learning management system was dictated by the college. We had to use a certain learning management system. We couldn't just come up with whatever we thought we wanted to use. So there were some restrictions with that, but there, it also helps because we have a lot of institutional support. So as we were going through these, we had, we had staff on hand as far as distance learning, as far, you know, all of, all of these people are, um, special services, all of these individuals were there to help support us in the process as well. Yes, it has definitely come with restrictions and support. So I think it's, it's been- What's the name of your agency again? We're at Elgin Community College. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we will move on. Okay, so just to give you a brief overview of our timeline, when we first began the project, we figured, well, it was ambitious and we said, we're gonna do it in eight weeks. Um, like Marcia said, we had the time constraint. We didn't really, we couldn't mess with it at all because contractually we had to have these courses in and reviewed so that they could be given to our instructors. Um, so we'll go into each one of these steps a little bit um, more in depth. Um, but like I said, we prioritize UDL principles and as such, we wanted to make sure that first we came up with our objectives, then developed assessments and then moved to resources um, and beyond. So week one, we just met with the development team and talked about um, different, what our topics and modules are going to be, and then took our outcomes and turned them into objectives. Week two was all about assessment. How often will the students be assessed? Um, what will they be asked to do? Things like that. Week three, um, they discussed the assessments in groups and developed them. Week four, they started to work with content for the first module. And then weeks five through eight, they went through the modules and continued to work on them and provide feedback to each other. So that first step, like I said, developing the objectives, we had created the templates already. And then Marsha actually went in and created a model of taking some course outcomes and turning them into learning objectives. 
for ESL, math, and reading and writing so that they had something to work from. Um, what was surprising about this part of the project is that we figured this part would be the easy part and it would go quite quickly. And that ended up being completely wrong. And our faculty really struggled with developing the objectives from the outcome. Uh, they, I think, lacked confidence. I think a lot of that was largely probably due to the fact that it was kind of the first step in the process. And we were, you know, at the beginning of our first and hopefully only global pandemic. Um, so it, there was a lot of things coming at everybody and, and it just wasn't as smooth a process as we expected for this first step. We do wish we could have had training on developing objectives. Um, and even though our original timeline for this step of the project was one week, I would say it took some people up to three weeks to go and do all of their outcomes into objectives. Um, and it was at this point, this very first step, that the faculty that was developing the courses um, started asking about materials and resources, which is the theme that you will see throughout. Because as we said, uh, we really wanted to prioritize that UDL. We really wanted to make sure that the materials were coming last and that we were really assessing our objectives. So after we had our outcomes and objectives, we did move on to assessment. So the first issue that we ran into is that assessment does not equal test. And our developers really kind of struggled um, getting around that mental hurdle. They, and a lot of this is due to habit, right? They've been teaching, we put them in courses to develop that they were quite familiar with. So they've been using a lot of assessments for many years or semesters um, and kind of taking them away from those tests and asking them to realign how they were approaching things um, ended up being a bit difficult. So not only did they have to focus on a different way of assessing, I think at first they were like, how do we put this test that we've used into the LMS? And Marsha and I were like, no, 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 we don't. Um, <laughs> so um, they, they had to really get past that traditional mindset um, and come at it to kind of leverage technology and embrace the new technological, um, I guess, environment a little bit more. Um, and this is something where we really, again, would have loved to have more time to provide training for our faculty in not only different ways to assess objectives, but how that can be done in an online environment. Um, if we had had all the time in the world, I think we would have looked for or created training uh, specifically on formative assessment in an online environment, because I think that was really um, one of the largest struggles for our developers, especially considering, you know, our ESL teachers, for example, are constantly walking around the classroom and, and listening to their students converse and engage in groups. And, and I think just having them understand how to be able to replicate that in an online environment was a task that took longer um, than we had. Okay, so the next step in our process is um, looking at resources. So our instructors wanted to jump to resources right away, but we wanted them to think about what they were teaching before they started looking at resources because we really wanted them to match the resources with what they were teaching rather than saying, hey, here's a resource, I'm going to just follow this resource and let it lead my class. So um, the team leaders actually went ahead in advance and looked at different resources to kind of present to the faculty as possibilities. Um, we really wanted to look for resources that were frequently up to up, updated. You know, we didn't want something that had been sitting there for a long time or that wasn't managed on a regular basis because those become stale quite easily. Um, we also looked to see if the resource was leveled because we wanted to make sure that, you know, for our classes, if we're using the same resource for multiple classes that teachers could do the appropriate level for that class. We also looked to make sure they were segmented because we wanted to make sure that there were clear um, breaks between sections so they'd be easier for students to follow along. Uh, we also looked for things that maybe had pairings 
so that there were additional resources that would go with the lesson or with the website that might be helpful to the um, synchronous lesson. The other thing that we looked at in advance for the faculty is we looked at um, whether resources were 508 compliant because this was really important. We had to have this. Um, we also made sure that the resources that we selected were accessible on different devices because again, smartphones, really um, prevalent in our population. A lot of people were using smartphones. We wanna make sure that they could get onto these resources and use them effectively on, on, those, um, on those phones. We also looked for um, Creative Commons licensing, open education resources, because these were more cost-effective for us as a program and would make it more sustainable long-term because we were looking when we were designing these, we were thinking not just COVID, we were thinking about what could we do even after COVID. So we wanted to make it sustainable. Um, after we went through, we kind of picked some resources that we thought were really good. We asked faculty if they had resources also that they wanted us to review and make sure that they matched up with these guidelines. And once we got that list, we um, reviewed them with the team. So the teams would meet and they would say, okay, here are two or three resources that we are going to use as a supplement to our classes. We told teachers that we don't wanna have 50 different websites. That's not effective. Students will get lost. Um, consistency is really important. So one of the websites we talked about was USA Learns. It was like, okay, we'll use that in level one, level two. We really wanted to make sure that we picked solid sites that really, um, were good resources, not just a resource for a resource. Um, one of the things that we did find was that faculty really had difficulty with this concept. Many of them had been very textbook based and they didn't like the idea of not being able to just use their textbook and go through the lessons in the textbook. But we kind of talked about, you know, using smaller passages, um, that textbooks are hard to read online, that you want to get something that's friendly, reader friendly online. And you want something that's interactive. You know, if you just have worksheets, those aren't interactive. If you go online and you find a good website, you're gonna find things that are interactive. All right, we'll move to the next one. So one of the um, resources that we selected, this was for our math classes, for our ABEASC classes, was CK12. And one of the reasons why we chose this site, and we will go into this if we have time at the end so you can actually see the site, but um, some of the things that we liked about it is that you can set up a class in the site. So you're able to track student progress. You can see what students did in there. You can assign lessons to students. So that it's very specific what they need to do when they go in there. Um, another thing that we liked was it was very dynamic and it had interactive act activities. So the students would actually, they, if you're given a problem, they click on it. If they get it right, it says, yes, that's correct. If they got it wrong, it gives them an explanation and says, hey, try again. You might want to think about this. So it was giving them feedback like a teacher would in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, the other thing that we liked was that any videos or explanations were very short. Again, time, um, time is important for students when they're online. If, it, if it's too long, they're not going to watch it. They're not going to read it. Um, it adjusts automatically to a student's level. So if a student misses a lot, it will go down a level. If a student gets everything right, it will go up a level. Um, it allows, again, teachers to see that mastery in progress, but it allows students to see mastery in progress as well. So they can check and see how they're doing. Um, the teachers found it very easy to navigate, very easy to set up, um, and it allowed for that individualization that we were looking for. Because again, adult ed students, even if they're in the same level, they're not the same level. So we wanted to make sure teachers could individualize if they needed to within their classrooms. And again, wonderful resource, all of these things, and it was free and open. Uh, for our beginning ESL classes, one of the websites that they selected was USA Learns. Um, USA Learns was developed by the, um, through the Department of Education many, many years ago. It's very user-friendly, it's very simple. Um, again, you can set it up as a class so you can give assignments to students so, they, so it's clear to them what they, need to do. It's, um, you can monitor students' progress as a faculty member if you set it up as a class. You can see what students have done, what they haven't. 
Um, it has very short videos and all of the videos have a text that goes with them. So the students can actually watch the video and read the text as they go along. Um, a lot of interactive activities where you listen and then you can read, say the word into your microphone and hear yourself. Um, flashcards, all of these things that are more interactive than just giving students a worksheet with directions and say, fill out the worksheet. Again, leveled, contextualized, and free. So teachers really like this site. For reading, um, this was for our intermediate and advanced ESL read readers, as well as our ABE ASC. We looked at several different resources. Um, ReadWorks was an excellent resource. Newzella was another one that was really good. Both of those had their plus and minuses. Um, one of the discoveries that we made that we really, really like CommonLit, um, commonlit.org. And again, really easy to set up a class, really easy for students to navigate. It is leveled and it's, um, you can select themes or you can select levels or you can select both. So you can really specify what types of readings you're looking for. Um, it has units and class lessons and paired readings. So like you might have a story and it might have a video that the students can watch as well that are already paired for you. So you don't have to go searching for those. Um, the readings themselves are amazing. Um, they are accessible. The students can have them read aloud to them, most of them. Um, you can change the font sizes on them. The texts are glossed. So they have the, uh, definitions at the bottom of the um, document. Um, some of them have translations. If, if the students need to translate for the very for the lower levels, if they're not sure, they can translate it. You can turn that off as a teacher if you if you if you choose, but it is available for them. Um, it allows students to highlight and annotate the text, so you could do this as a in class, and the students could see each other. You know, you can see annotations. Um, the exercises are really easy. They have assessments and discussions um, for this. Uh, the other thing is that you can download the read the reading exercise and the questions into a PDF if you want, if you want the students to work um, offline, you know, if they have limited bandwidth, they can always download the story and do all the exercises there if they want. There's a pre-assessment in there. And again, it is free. And somebody asked me to type it in, it's commonlit.org. Um, another really great thing about it is it has teacher support. They have webinars regularly to, um, help teachers learn the different features of it. So it's a really great um, website. It's used a lot in K-12. All right, next. Okay, so the other thing that our teachers wanted to um, look for was something for our intermediate and, and advanced students that would help them with reading and grammar. And this is another website that it was a really an amazing find as we were looking through everything else. It's called Quill and it's quill.org. Again, it allows you to set up classes, monitor student pro progress, easy to use. It has a diagnostic. So if you wanted to individualize instruction, you can have the students do the diagnostic and assign them um, lessons according to what they need, which is just wonderful. A lot of our teachers like that. Um, the readings in it are, le are leveled. Um, they have the readability levels. It's linked to common core standards. It includes writing, grammar, it has different topics. Um, it has, it gives you the option to do whole class instruction or just independent practice. Like I said, it can be used for students that need maybe a little bit of um, remediation in something. And again, this is a free resource. So these were some of the um, ones that we found that we really, really liked. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop for a second. Um, it says the slides you shared are not the slides you're sharing yeah, now. I just saw that. No, you are correct. I shared the wrong presentation. I am sorry. How in the world did that happen? I put it in the wrong folder. I apologize. It is Friday. It is. I feel like it's like week this happened on Monday Fridays. or Friday. <laughs> yes. So Marcia, why don't you go ahead with the Oh, sorry. Am I even showing the slide anymore? What are you looking at? Okay. 
why don't you go ahead and I will make sure that I put the correct one in the chat while you're going through this slide. Okay, yeah, we, it is Friday and um, yeah, we did change a few things as we were going along, so sorry. I'm sorry. Did you want to go, do, do you want us to go back and just kind of show the, no, I'll, I'll just move forward. We'll, we'll um, share yeah, the resources at the end. We have the links to the resources, so you'll be able to see them. Okay, so some of the activities that, again, we were talking about activities that we would share with um, the students. We talked a lot about video lessons. Um, again, the conversation with teachers was that we wanted to make sure the video lessons were preferably five minutes or less because students don't want to watch a 20 minute video. Um, we, we had the synchronous component to do more of that direct instruction. So the video lessons that we looked at, we were trying to use as a reinforcement or maybe in a flipped model where the students would watch something really brief and then be able to bring um, questions to class. Um, we also want to make sure that they were accessible, that they, they had closed captioning on them so that students would be able to read them if, you know, if they needed to. Um, checked for Creative Commons licensing, open resources. Um, another way we use videos is we use video pairings, so like TED Talks, to go with something that um, students were reading, um, content-related types of paired videos. Uh, we did use some worksheets, uh, probably more than we would have liked, honestly, because worksheets are problematic in an LMS and in distance learning, because now we get into that cell phone issue, we get into that tablet issue. It's harder for students to access a Word document or a PDF. You know, a Word document you can type into, a PDF you can't type into, so they'd have to print the worksheets. Um, we talked about using Google, but then we ran into sharing issues because the document would be owned by the teacher who created it. But we were sharing these classes across different platforms or uh, uh, sections, I should say. So there were many teachers teaching the class and you didn't want everybody asking you for access for other classes. So we had some challenge with worksheets. We're still working on that, to be honest. Um, we're telling teachers to do it in Word and then when the class is shared with them, they can upload it into Google Docs to make it easier for students. And that way it's in their folder and they have access and they can grant permissions they can see the students work rather than um, having Google Docs in there that goes to go to a different teacher. Um, other activities that we included were discussion boards. Um, we used surveys and quizzes to kind of assess students. But again, surveys and quizzes, surveys were maybe a reflective question or like a two or three questions just to do a learning check. The quizzes were a little bit longer, but we tried to keep those within like a 30 minute quiz at the most. Um, for assessment because again we try to emphasize to our teachers that online things are much more difficult much more challenging take much more time um, other things that we included were the, like i talked about reflections what did you learn what more do you want so that the students had the chance to give that feedback to teachers and we did a lot of projects so we um one of the things that the teachers did is the students would do a photo project so they could take a picture and write a story about it and it'd be more personal for them or we had some echo readings where the students would read something and then they would report it and the teacher would listen to it. So there are all sorts of different activities that we used. And then the last step um, was actually creating the class in the LMS. So as we've said, we had this whole thing developed in a shared Google folder or a series of shared Google folders. Um, and once we went to put them into the LMS, was where we realized some limitations that we previously had not been as aware of as we could have been. Um, one of the main limitations that we ran into was the limitation of the tools that we had to use for assessments. Uh, there were not as many kind of creative tools as we would have liked for our lower levels specifically. Um, embedding pictures and symbols and things like that was very difficult, which obviously is not ideal specifically for our lower levels. We ran into the same issue with a lot of our math classes. Diagrams were very difficult. Um, a lot, some of the assessment tools took a lot of clicks to get into. So that was an issue because as we said, we wanted to make sure that the students had as simple a navigation process as possible. 
the type of feedback that was able to be given in some of the tools was not as robust as we would have liked and didn't allow for as much creativity or variety as we would have liked. Um, and there was just really an overall lack of flexibility in the assessment tool in the LMS. Um, so that was somewhat problematic and we're still working on the best ways to assess our students in different levels. Uh, we have some things like the resources that Marsha shared earlier where they're just embedded um, and linked in the LMS and things like that. Lots of different creative assessments that our, our faculty is working with. Um, but not many of them are embedded in the LMS. They're more linked as tasks for the students to complete. So in addition to that, we also, as Marcia said, we use checklists. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with D2L. They have module guides, which are kind of um, like a kind of a winding map of crazy roads that crisscross in my opinion. Um, but the checklist is nice and simple. The students click on it and it's just task one, two, three, four, and they can check it, which allows this teacher to see the progress that the student is making, even if it's a task that's not done in the LMS. So for example, they might have to watch a video or um, practice something and they can just check that off, even though it's not something that the teacher will have the ability to evaluate. Um, we ran into issues with flipped classroom and that was more of, I think that was more due to a time constraint um, and a lack of training and a lack of familiarity with the tools we had at our disposal than anything else. Um, Marcia mentioned the Google Drive issues. Uh, we're still working on getting everyone to force copies on their Google Docs and Google Drive because we do have some teachers that just get like 200 surveys submitted to their Google form um, and they're not their students. And then we also, um, an issue that we had was that some of our faculty was not confident in uploading their courses into the LMS. Um, so because of the time crunch and because of the nature of the pandemic and the situation that it was, we did have um, primarily Marsha and me uploading several of the courses ourselves um, with the, the things that had been created by the developers. So questions. Thank you, Holly put the evaluation in the chat. Um, thank you. Yes. All right. So we are going to, if there are no questions, we will move on and our contact information is on the slides, which you now have because I sent you the correct document this time. I apologize. Um, so yes, so you can email us with any questions. All right. So now we're getting into kind of what happened once the courses were moving. Okay. So Ideally, we would have had a very re robust review um, of the classes. Because of, again, we had a month, we didn't even have a month, we had about a week after the classes were finished before we had to publish the classes for other faculty to look at and to prepare for the fall semester. So um, part of the review process was during the, pro during while we were doing it, uh, the faculty did have the classes shared, the ones that were developing and they did provide feedback to one another. That was very helpful. I would really highly recommend doing this kind of development in teams because some of the ideas that were carried across were just excellent. Um, due to the limited time, there was less review than faculty wanted to do. I did receive emails saying, hey, I'd really like to look at this closer. There's some things I'd, I'd like to get comments on. I just don't have the time. I'm developing my own class. I can't review the other one as much as I would like to. And we would have also liked to have released the classes and had time to do a final peer review where people who were teaching the classes but didn't develop them could give um, some feedback. But again, during the summer, we didn't have that opportunity. We did do it later and we'll talk about it afterwards about what we did after to review it. But at the time, we didn't have that time. Um, it was also, reviewed by administration. Heather went through the classes. I went through the classes. Um, our dean went through the classes. 
but we had 20 classes that we had to review in a week. So it, again, it wasn't as thorough as we would have liked. And we did go back and do more of the review afterwards. Um, and usually distance learning would have also done a complete review to look for accessibility, um, look for formatting and everything else. But they had all of the classes at the college that they had to work with, which were, you know, I think 140, 150 classes all come in at, at the same time. So they didn't have the chance to do that review either. So we did a, a, a brief review process, but not as thorough as what we would, would have liked and would have done in an ideal situation. So also, after, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was fine. That's okay. Um, You're good. Okay, so we did have training for the faculty. Like we already said, there was an institutionally mandated LMS course uh, that the whole, every, all the faculty in the college was required to take. Additionally, we created departmentally some Zoom trainings for the faculty, um, and we recorded them and emailed them and put them on our website. We did the same thing for um, kind of more of a course navigation training. Um, we found that the training that was provided by the college was very uh, technical and didn't really get at the practical ins and outs as much as our faculty would have liked. So we did do more of the training kind of within the courses once they had them um, and they knew what they were working with instead of out of context, which they had previously had. Uh, our, we've had institutional support. Our distance learning team has been fantastic um, and they answer faculty questions all the time and our questions all the time. Um, and we've also had one-on-one -on -one sessions with faculty as necessary. We've had some faculty that have had a bit more of a learning curve and we have spent many hours on Zoom meetings with them, um, just making sure they have the tools and the support they need to help their students. In addition, We've also had continuous faculty support. They have, um, I have had weekly office hours for our faculty, um, specifically for tech support. Uh, I've done it, I did it twice weekly for probably the first month and a half to two months of fall semester. Um, I did it at the end of fall semester to help them with any wrap up tech stuff they needed um, to get their end of the semester stuff done. And then I did it for the first month of spring semester and I will do it again at the end of spring semester and I'm sure I will do it again at summer semester. Um, but they do have weekly office hours accessible to them. Additionally, like I said, our distance learning team is always available to them, which has been great. Um, we continue to have the one on one sessions as necessary as does our distance learning team. And we do have uh, D2L support, our LMS, and that was um, purchased by the institution, uh, which again is why we chose the LMS to begin with. So our faculty has not only the actual D2L um, support team as support, but they also have our distance learning team and us um, departmentally. And then we did, um, kind of follow up at the midterm. We had faculty feedback first. We had group meetings for every single level offered in the program. And we had Zoom meetings where they could meet with me and they could meet with Marsha, just give all their feedback. Um, we did find that most of the feedback we got was not content related, but it was format or access related. So we were able to make some changes in the courses uh, based on that feedback. We also had shared documents set up and email procedures set up if they couldn't attend the Zoom meetings so that they could provide feedback. We had student feedback. Um, our access to student feedback is limited for contractual reasons. So we were able to poll them. Um, well, we were able to give their instructors a poll I believe to give to the students if they so choose. And we had just under 600 students in the program at the time and we had just over 200 responses. So we had a pretty good response rate. And we asked them um, basically what preferences they had going into fall um, as we were still making decisions about fall at that time. And the majority of our student, that 60.8% that you see in green, um, wanted to have classes just the way they were, staying fully remote with half of it synchronous and half of it asynchronous. 
Um, I believe that 27.5%, Marsha, was that the hybrid on campus and asynchronous? No, that was face-to-face -face fully. Oh, was that fully face-to-face? -face? Okay. That was fully face-to-face. -face. Um, and, and I'll just mention a couple of things. This poll was taken in fall of 2021, and we were asking students for fall of 2022. So we really wanted to know, because we we're trying to make planning. We already knew spring was right. going to be online. We really wanted to plan for the next fall and see if we can come back to classes, if students wanted to come back to class. And that 60%, there, students were really worried about COVID. Um, so a lot of the, even the ones that said face-to-face -face, said they would go online if COVID was still an issue. So even, even the ones that said they did want face-to-face, -face, the red and the yellow are talking about hybrid classes. So students were looking at, you know, a face-to-face -face and online component. Some of them said that would work. Uh, the other thing that came out of this, just sorry to budge in, Heather, Go for it. was that um, we were reaching a lot of students that we weren't able to reach before. We had a lot of students saying, hey, I love that you have online classes. I couldn't take classes before face-to-face. -face. Um, students love the fact that the classes were shorter because we could start them later and they could get home from work and they didn't have to worry about rushing off to school. So part of this was COVID related that students were concerned about coming back to campus because of safety, but part of the 60% um, were because they actually preferred the format. It worked better for them. Mm -hmm. um, we also, in addition to that, we haven't had a lot of, we don't have a lot of data um, on our retention and persistence since we're still kind of in a pandemic, unfortunately. Um, so we have not been doing this long enough to have solid data on that. Additionally, our state database for adult ed, um, we got a new version of it uh, this past summer because there's no better time to change your database than in the midst of a pandemic. So we are, um, we do have limited ability to make comparisons to previous years um, with certain things. But um, our students did, or sorry, our teachers rather, did report um, a high success rate and a higher pass rate for the students. So in that way, it's been very positive. Okay, so we're going to finish up with the lessons that we learned through this process. We've kind of mentioned them as we went through, but we wanted to summarize, summarize them a little bit. Um, we're going to start with some of the things that we need to do and then talk about some of the things that were really positive that came out of it. So we decided that if we had in a perfect world with lots of time, um, we needed to have training and flip, um, flip classrooms and UDL for faculty. I think a lot of some training, they would have gotten the idea a little bit better. It was a quick switch over. Some of them were trying to think about backwards design and it was a little challenging for them. Um, I think that would have made our classes le less text dependent overall, even in our face-to-face -face classes. I think that, that that training in UDL would really be helpful for, for our face-to-face -face when we go back as well. Um, we also could have used some assessment training as Heather mentioned, as far as how to do this in a virtual situation. Um, other things that we discovered is that we really needed more training in our LMS. We had the six, the six week training but it didn't go into the nitty gritty of how to upload a video, how to upload this, how to do the really specific things that teachers learned that they needed to do with the class. So it would have been nice to have had um, more practical training. The training was more philosophical and that would have been better for us at this point. Um, another thing we thought about that training is that because it was all online, the training was originally supposed to be partially face-to-face and I think that the discussion between faculty wasn't as strong as it could have been as a result. Um, another thing that we decided was that we could have had more roundtables or discussions with teachers in specific courses. So we, the course developers, like a course developer would do a level two class. It would have been nice for all the level two teachers to come in and talk with the course developer and talk about how it's structured, what the philosophy is in person rather than just having it in notes because it's harder to translate on paper if they could have walked through and said, hey, here's this lesson, this is what I was thinking, it would have been helpful for the teachers. Um, 
one of the biggest things we found out is that our tech savvy instructors, were, their students were much more successful. So again, giving teachers more support in learning the technology, giving them more practice on using the technology so that they have that confidence would mean better student success overall because the students can kind of tell when the teacher is nervous. Um, the other thing that we talked about was the inconsistent student ability in technology that maybe we could do more training with the students with technology specific. All right. All right. And something else we learned um, was that we don't have the support we need. And what that means is we do, like we've said, we have a phenomenal distance learning team. And I cannot even imagine um, how little they've slept in the last 11 months, because I feel like every time Marsha and I email them for a meeting, they are more than willing to do it. And we are just two of several people they are serving. So um, while we do have amazing support, we do need more of it. And specifically, we need more support in the evenings because we do have a large population that attend evening classes. Um, and we also do not have any bilingual support um, that I know of. And we are technically a Hispanic serving institution. I mean, our ESL program serves several other languages, obviously, but even just having um, a bilingual English Spanish support in place would be very helpful. Um, another issue with the support is that our website is very difficult for our students to navigate. Um, it is very academic looking and it's very dense. Um, so it's not clear where the students need to go for support. There are several different places they could go and um, it kind of makes it seem um, like you, there's not a lot of confidence that you're choosing the right one. Um, so the website needs to be a little bit friendlier for our students to navigate definitely less complex text, less dense text. And if we could have PM and bilingual support, that would be beautiful. Um, and we don't have Zoom support at our institution, which is quite interesting because we do have an institutional Zoom license. So I would say me personally, most of the support that I provide students is Zoom based. It's, it's like they need help with Zoom um, over anything else because usually their instructors uh, can get them through the LMS okay, but they can't get to their instructors as well without Zoom. So that's where I spend a lot of time with my students. Okay, so some of the positives is that we found that we used consistent platform and using consistent tools across the level has been very beneficial for both teachers and students because our teachers don't necessarily teach the same level from semester to semester. And having it standardized as the students have progressed to the second semester, both teachers and students are telling us, hey, this is a lot easier this time around. I get it. Um, we also did a, um, an orientation that was for the students the first week of classes that's in D2L that they go through with their teachers. And that's in every class so that every time they start the semester, they go through a, an orientation so that if they forgot how to use something, it's a quick reminder. And a lot of teachers, again, said this is very helpful because they don't just jump into a class, they jump into an orientation, they get to know the students, they get to do get to know you exercises during this orientation and really simple things within the LMS. Um, Another thing that we found is that our faculty is, most of them, I won't say all of them, most of them have said they're, they are so happy to have this course shell to start from. Um, they teach at other institutions. Some of them are using canned courses and they said they love having a course shell because they have things there for them to teach. They have a starting point, but they also have the flexibility to add or delete things as their students need them. So it gives them a lot of flexibility. Um, the other thing they talked about is that in our course shell that we have a lot of things that are students working together. We have a lot of things where um, they, they um, 
I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but it, it's that collaboration of the students that, that's part of the lessons that were built in there that don't exist in the CAN programs. So they, uh, they've been reporting really positive things about it. Um, I will tell you the other positive thing um, that we found is that there's been an amazing, amazing amount of growth by both students and faculty. Very, a lot more dependence in the fall, this spring, um, don't have as many questions. The students are, are, being, are flourishing and um, the students are actually telling their teachers, this is being reported to me by teachers and by students who email me, that they feel so much better about themselves because they are navigating in an online environment. They feel much more confident. They feel like they're developing their technical skills. They, they're really excited about, yes, I'm learning language or yes, I'm learning math. Yes, I'm learning reading, but I'm also learning how to use the computer. I'm also learning how to communicate online. I'm also learning all these things and they're very excited about it. And um, so our students, as we said earlier, are very happy to have an online option. They have crazy work schedules and they have so many different um, moving parts in their daily lives. So they've been really appreciative to have this option. And that does extend beyond just COVID. Um, a lot of our teachers are reporting a greater sense of community. And we have students using, more students using office hours. Um, we have students more actively engaged uh, during their independent time um, when they're not face to face with their instructors um, or synchronously meeting with their instructors. Um, our students are much better advocates for themselves than they used to be. They are very good at contacting people and saying, this is my problem and this is what I need help with. And that's something that we didn't see as strongly when we just had face to face classes. Um, we have way fewer subs than we used to and more consistent attendance by, well, obviously faculty and students because of the online environment. Um, we've only had a handful of subs in the semester and a half that we've been doing this, um, which is great. And additionally, it has um, been cost saving overall. So those are some of the lessons we have learned. And we do have some time for questions. And there was a question that was put in the chat that I said I would get to afterwards. Um, so just to clarify, the question was about the student's pass rate. Our students do take the CASAS test, but their progress through our program is not dependent on their performance on the CASAS test. So we do have departmentally standardized, um, we call them assessment forms. They're basically competency checklists that each level has, and um, the students must demonstrate mastery of the competencies before they can move from one level to the next. So while they do test on CASAS, that is not, um, taken into consideration when passing from one level to the next in ESL specifically. In our math and reading, Marcia, you can probably talk a little bit more about that and how they've been performing. So it's very similar with the math and reading classes. Um, they do have an initial placement on, we're using CASAS goals now, it used to be the tape test that we used. Um, we do have an initial placement with that, but we do an interview with the students as well to get some of their background and their history, how long have they been out of school, what level, what grade did they complete, um, to help with that placement process. As far as moving from level to level, we again we have standardized assessments that we usually use to say, okay, if a student can do this, 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 and this, and has demonstrated it in class and homework and everything else, the student moves to the next level. Um, we all know the shortcomings of standardized testing. We do test them, we pre-test them, we post-test them. Um, we were meeting our state targets with the testing. We don't know yet for this year, just because it took us so long to get online testing and distance testing set up. A lot of our students pre-tested later in the fall semester and are just post-testing now. So we're not really sure about our outcomes that way. Um, We'll find out at the end of the at the end of the school year. But as far as persistence, um, we had more students who were in fall classes continue to spring classes than we usually do. 
I do know that, um, again, attendance has been better. We've had students who have been able to attend classes all through COVID. They've had COVID. They've We've been, had students um, attend from hospital beds. I know two yes. teachers that have had students attend from hospital beds. So, you know, to us, that says what we're doing is really working. Students want to be there. They like what we're doing. They're being successful. That's that's the best measure for me is that students. We do not to encourage to them to attend from hospital beds, though. <laughs> Just making that clear. Oh, no, 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 no. But, yes. <laughs> They appreciate the convenience, but we hope they get better and take the time they need. <laughs> yeah, we, our quarantine students have, have been just so happy that they can go to class. And every, with isolation, everybody likes having the synchronous lessons. Um, they feel like they have more connection with other people in this COVID environment. I know some of our teachers have said, like, they say goodnight to their students' kids, like, the same time every night the kid runs over and gives mom a kiss and, like, waves to the class and runs back. So they have reported a larger sense of community, which is really interesting because that was something we were concerned would suffer um, in a remote setting. What other questions are there? We only have a couple minutes left. So I will put the resources up there. We're not gonna have time to go into them. Um, and then our um, contact information is on the last slide. Um, <laughs> no, our classes, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> No, if our developers made it through developing a course in eight weeks, it was not the courses that put the students in the hospital or the developers, thankfully. <laughs> All right, well, I will put our contact information up there. And if you have any questions, we've got another two minutes. If not, um, you've got our contact information and a set of slides and a bonus set of slides that you can look at if you so choose or can delete, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and feel free to contact us with anything. You can hang out and ask questions or you can go on your way. Thank you.